friends. Wake up. Bonus points. I'm Joel and you're watching Peace in America. Today, dog law. Uh. Last week, this channel dropped the hot single, Any Dog. And the week before that, you learned right here on Peace in America how to argue before the United States Supreme Court. Mamma mia! Today, we're going to take those last two episodes and we're going to combine them into one. That's right, you may have heard of bird law. Well, let me lay down some dog law. I will show you in this episode, you never knew the law could be so beautiful. Today, I will share with you three judicial opinions discussing dog law. These are gonna be ancient opinions and we're gonna get some ancient wisdom. The love and appreciation that is shown for dogs in this episode will make your heart bump out of your chest. You will feel feels and you will like it. It's a true story about me when I got my first job after law school I was interviewing with the judge and she asked me do you have a dog and I said no and she said I don't like you. Dog law. Dog law. First up we have a decision from the Supreme Court of Georgia. Montgomery versus Maryland Casualty Company, decided January 16th, 1930. This case is a workers' compensation case. And what happened was a man named John Montgomery worked as a watchman for a company called James A. Rourke Machine Company, which operated on a river and had a plant which repaired boats. Unfortunately, Mr. Montgomery ended up drowning. He jumped into the river to try to save his dog. John Montgomery's widow applied to the Industrial Commission for compensation. The application was denied. And and that finding was upheld by the Superior Court of Chatham County. On further appeal, the decision was affirmed by the Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court of Georgia granted a writ of certiorari. The plaintiff, the widow of Mr. Montgomery, argued that the dog was a necessary part of her husband's equipment, which he used in discharging his duty as a watchman. However, the court disagreed and ultimately affirmed the decision to deny the application. You see here where it says syllabus, this is where the court is laying out the rules that it's going to apply in this decision. These are rules of law and this syllabus is a skeleton of the law that if you follow will lead you to the conclusion in the case. In our episode two weeks ago when we learned how to argue before the United States Supreme Court, one of the issues we discussed was you should know the standard of review. Here, the court lists the standard of review applicable in this case, one of them being under the provisions of the Workers' Compensation Act, the findings of fact by the Industrial Commission are final and conclusive. The finding of that body, the Industrial Commission, cannot be reviewed in the Superior Court if there is evidence to support its finding. Such finding cannot be reviewed in the Appellate Court. This is just going to show you the Appellate Court is concerned with issues of law. If there is a finding of fact that's made below that is somehow supported by the record, the appellate court, as part of its standard of review, is going to take those facts as a given and is not going to redo those. Next, we have something that's not really a standard of review, but is setting out the legal requirements in order to get workers' compensation. And it says here, under the terms of the Workers' Compensation Act, in order for compensation to be due, the injury to the employee must arise both out of and in the course of the employment. Neither alone is enough, meaning the injury has to occur while the employee is working and the injury must be related to and be part of what the employee is required to do. And here the court tells you its conclusion that based on the evidence and the law, the dog here was not part of the watchman's equipment, although the dog was useful as a watchdog and companion. The court cites a case saying the dog cannot legally be classified as a fellow workman. Next, the court addresses a possible exception and says it does not apply. The court says, the act of the watchman in attempting to rescue the dog, which had jumped or fallen into the river, 
was not an emergency so as to constitute the act one performed in behalf of the employer arising out of and within the scope of the employment. The court seems to indicate here that if it or the fact finding body below had considered this situation to be an emergency, then possibly an exception would apply and the watchman's act of rescuing his dog would fall within the scope of employment. And the court gives a summary of its conclusion. It says the findings of fact by the commissioner first passing upon the application and latter the full commission are supported by evidence. It follows that there was no responsibility on the part of the master or of the insurer under the Workers' Compensation Act arising out of the fatal accident to the watchman who lost his life in the humane act of rescuing the dog. The dog being present as a volunteer, not at the insistence of the master or in consequence of any duty of the master. It may be added that the dog was probably in no danger of drowning and that the humane act of the watchman in endeavoring to rescue him constituted in itself the only element of danger. Here this is a factual issue. Was the dog actually at risk of drowning? And the court here says based on the facts in this case the dog actually wasn't in danger of drowning and this connects to the idea that therefore this was not an emergency and that the watchman decision to jump in the river and try to save the dog was more an act that he did voluntarily and it was not part of his job duties and that this was just an accident that the court could not connect to the watchman's job. The court says from the dawn of primal history the dog has loomed large in the art and literature of the world including judicial literature so it doubtless will be until the crack of doom. In metal and in stone his noble image has been perpetuated but the dog's chief monument is in the heart of his friend, a man. As a house pet, a watchdog, a herder of sheep and cattle, in the field of sport, and as the motive power of transportation, especially in the ice fields of the far north, as well as in the Antarctic, the dog has ever been a faithful companion and helper of man. In the trackless forests of the New World, he was on the firing line of civilization in the task of subduing all enemies, whether savage man or wild beast. We find in a Astrology, the dog star is the brightest star in the heaven, the alpha of the constellation Canis Major. In Greek mythology, Cerebus is the watchdog at the entrance of the infernal region. Diana, the goddess, had her deer hounds, and literature is enriched by the story of Odysseus. Ulysses' dog Ergos. After 20 years of war and wandering, this king of Ithaca returned, unrecognized in his beggar rags, even by Penelope. But as he entered the courtyard, lo, a hound raised up his head and pricked his ears. In times past, the men used to lead the hound against wild goats and deer and hares, but now, as then despised, he lay in the deep dung of mules and kind. There lay the dog Ergos, full of fleas. Yet even now, when he was aware of Odysseus standing by, he he wagged his tail and dropped his ears, but nearer to his lord he had not strength to drop. Odysseus looked aside and brushed away a tear. Among many of the most beautiful of nature's plants and trees, we have the dogwood, dog daisy, dog laurel, dog rose, dog violet, and the like. There are dog days, the dog watch, on shipboard, there is dogma, doggery, dog Latin, and the dogged. As Shakespeare wrote, doth dogged war bristle his angry crest and snarl in the gentle eyes of peace. Who loves me loves my dog is a French proverb of the 13th century and in substance has figured in the literature of many writers, including St. Bernard, Clairvaux, and Erasmus. Poets great and small, their pens inspired by the Olympic maid, have paid tribute to the dog. Lord Byron, who was devoted to Boson, wrote of him, but the poor dog in life, the firmest friend, the first to welcome or most to defend, whose honest heart is still his master's own who labors fights lives breathes for him alone tis sweet to hear the watchdog's honest bark bay deep mouth welcome as we draw near home in macbeth shakespeare gives us quite a catalog of dogs hounds and greyhounds mongrel spaniels shows water rugs and demi wolves the swift the slow the subtle the housekeeper the hunter and in midsummer night's dream speaking of hounds he says their heads are hung with ears that swept away the morning dew crook kneed and dew lapped like thessalian bulls slow in pursuit but matched in mouth like bells each unto each 
such gallant chiding for beside the groves the skies the fountains every region near seemed all one mutual cry i never heard so musical a discord such sweet thunder sir john lucas in the poem to a dog pictures his wrath in a canine paradise where the little faithful barking ghost may leap to lick my phantom hand and so with other poets almost without number among whom are chaucer sir walter scott alexander pope kipling trowbridge ruskin and of course stephen o foster the author of so many beautiful southern melodies it was he he wrote of old dog trey old dog trey's ever faithful Full grief cannot drive him away. He is gentle, he is kind. I shall never, never find a better friend than old dog Trey. Socrates wrote, When I see some men, I love my dog the more. Varian Curve considered the dog the most complete, the most singular, and the most useful conquest man has gained in the animal world. Lord Byron had graven on a marble shaft this tribute to his dog. Near this spot is deposited the remains of one who possessed beauty without vanity, strength without insolence, courage without ferocity, and all the virtues of man without his vices. This praise, which would be but meaningless flattery if subscribed over human ashes, is but a just tribute to the memory of Osan, a dog who was born at Newfoundland in 1803 and died at Newstead Abbey, November 18th, 1808. In like vein, Alexander H. Stevens wrote for his sagacious poodle Rio, here rest the remains of what in life was a satire on the human race and an honor to his own, a faithful dog. Credit is due to Pippa Passes and Rather Doggily, a little classic by William William C. Jones, from which I quote as follows. When the house is still and only the wind is abroad, Pippa muses by the fire at her master's feet, black muzzle on white paws, and in her eyes that question which troubled the soul of Tame and Carlyle. Is the universe friendly or nay? The hearth is red, fleecy the rug, the shadows flickering warm, but Pippa is too staunch a terrier to leave danger or doubt unchallenged. She sniffs the unseen, then turns a more disquieted glance glance to the being in the chair. That damp, twitching nose senses truth beyond the oracle of his book, news beyond his radio's find. A growl snarls, a rush to the window, a dash to the locked door. She lunges and scratches and leaps back bristled, flanks heaving, teeth snapping in her throat, a hubbub that would rejoice the heart of three-headed Cerebus. The master is roused. What skulker, what power of darkness? A witch, perchance. Worse, it is that agent anathema of a good dog's world, the dragon that would upset all seven of the tail wagging heaven. It is Grimalik, the stray cat, a wild charge to the back fence, followed by a fettering of every nook which might harbor the foe. So placates Pippa that she returns with tail as high as a bobtail well could be. As soon is a slumber on the rug, when a dutiful ox dies, no epitaph is written. Rather, he is flayed for the parsimonious tanner. When a mule goes the way of all flesh, no mound is reared, serviceful though his years have been. When a lambkin lies still and stark on the trencher, even the poet, even the poet who was wont to rhyme on the pretty innocent, will regale himself with one of its chops. But when a certain little creature having a bark at one end and a bit of tail at the other, with a flea or two between, takes leave for the isles of the blessed, the lords of earth look foolish while their ladies weep and humanity feels a tug at the heart and here the court finishes while all that might be true while our love for dogs may be never ending we cannot make a legal decision based on that and so the court says from what has been said it will not be difficult to ascertain where the sentiment and inclination of the court would lead the court however is a court for the correction of errors and we must be guided by the law the law of the case will be found in the head notes so you see this beautiful tribute to the dog was not actually part of the court's decision it included this to concede some ground and admit that yes we all love dogs but that's not the issue this opinion very well could have been written without that long tribute but it's neat that the court did the research so that this tribute could be recorded in history for all time <laughs>
next case is Wiley versus Slater. This case was decided by the New York Supreme Court on July 8th, 1856. This is an example of, despite the high burden and the challenging standard of review, the appellate court disagreed with the trial court's decision and found merit to the appeal, reversed the court below, and vacated a judgment. As we go through this, we'll see why the court decided to do this. So right below the title, Wiley versus Slater, it's not labeled, but this is, again, the court's syllabus. This is the legal skeleton of the court's opinion about to follow. All of these are the points of law which, generally in order, dispose of different issues that are being contested in this case. Again, it's not labeled, but if you look at the third paragraph, this is an important proposition of law in this case. It states, but if the judgment is entirely unsupported by evidence so that it is really against law, the county court should reverse it. And if it fails to do so, it is the duty of the Supreme Court to correct the error and reverse the judgments of both courts. This is the test that applies to this appeal. And this is the appellant's burden to show that the judgment of the court below is entirely unsupported by evidence. The case of Wiley v. Slater is a case about fighting dogs. This is not Michael Vick we're talking about here. This is dogs in a neighborhood getting into a fight. As we will see, the plaintiff's dog died. So notice this starts out, it says, appeal from a judgment of the Oneida County Court affirming the judgment of a justice. So we know this is basically an appeal of an appeal. The original decision maker, it appears it was a justice of the peace, and that was appealed to a county court, and the county court affirmed. So now we're in the Supreme Court of New York. The action was brought to recover damages for alleged injuries to the plaintiff's dog inflicted by the defendant's dog in a fight in consequence of which the plaintiff's dog died. The complaint alleged first, that on or about the 29th day of May 1855, the defendant set dogs upon and who bit and maimed and greatly injured the plaintiff's dog and that the defendant struck, kicked, jammed, and injured the plaintiff's dog so that he died from said injuries to the damage of the plaintiff of $100. Second, that or on about the 29th of May 1855, the defendant's dog and dogs attacked bit and greatly injured the plaintiff's dog so that he died, and that this defendant will know that his dogs were ferocious, dangerous, and were accustomed to bite and injure other dogs and animals, but still kept and still keeps said dog, well knowing him to be dangerous and accustomed to bite. And the plaintiff demanded judgment against the defendant for $100. The defendant, by his answer, denied the complaint and each and every allegation contained therein. And for a further answer, he alleged that, at the time mentioned in said complaint, he heard dogs fighting and went to them. And amongst them were the plaintiff's dog. And as soon as the defendant saw the plaintiff's dog and the others fighting, he parted said dogs. At the close of the plaintiff's testimony, the defendant moved for a non-suit. First, on the ground that the plaintiff had not shown that the dog which did the injury belonged to the defendant. Second, that the plaintiff had not shown that the defendant had knowledge that his dog was accustomed to attack. The motion was denied. The justice rendered a judgment in favor of the plaintiff for $25 damages and $5 in costs, and the county court affirmed the judgment. The defendant then appealed to this court. This opinion really goes for it. Kind of like the last opinion, this one is basically saying, you know what, when it comes to a dog fight, I can't even judge this. I'm a judge, I respect dogs so much, I refuse to judge a dog fight because I'm not a dog and that's not fair. And it really should be judged by other dogs. The court does so in this language. It says, this is the first time I have been called upon to administer the law in the case of a pure dog fight or a fight in which the dogs instead of the owners were the principal actors. I have had occasion to preside upon the trial of actions for assaults and batteries originating in a phrase in which the masters of dogs have borne a conspicuous part 
and acquitted themselves in a manner which might well have aroused the envy of their canine dependents. The branch of the law, therefore, applicable to direct conflicts and collisions between dog and dog is entirely new to me, and this case opens up to me an entire new field of investigation. I am constrained to admit total ignorance of the code duello among dogs, or what constitutes a just cause of offense and justifies a resort to ultima ratio regum, a resort to arms, or rather to teeth, for redress, whether jealousy is a just cause of war, or what different degrees and kinds of insult or slight, or what violation of the rules of etiquette entitle the injured or offended beast to insist upon prompt and appropriate satisfaction. I know not am and glad to know that no nice question upon the conduct of the conflict on the part of the principal act arises in this case. It is not claimed upon either side that the struggle was not in all respects dog-like and fair. I have been a firm believer with the poet in the instructive, if not semi-divine, right of dogs to fight. And with him would say, let dogs delight to bark and bite, for God hath made them so. Let bears and lions growl and fight, for tis their nature too. So the court essentially says, this is what I think about the case. I'll tell you the first main thing I thought about. First difficulty I met with is a want of proof of ownership by the defendant of the offending dog. The plaintiff made a prima facie case by proving an apparent possession of the dog, but the appearances were entirely explained by the witness, Noel, who testifies that the dog was not owned by the defendant, nor kept, nor harbored by him, but was really a trespasser or on the premises being kept at the shop adjoining. Upon the question of ownership, there is really no conflict of testimony. The court is saying the only evidence at trial was the testimony of Noel, who said that the defendant didn't own the dog. Second, whatever may have been the character and habits of the dog, there is no evidence that he was the aggressor or in the wrong in this particular fight. We already know from the preceding paragraph, the biggest issue the court thought was there's no evidence that the defendant owned the dog. And then the court goes on and they're saying, well, okay, let's assume that was a problem. The next problem would be, this is like in logical order, let's say they did own the dog. You didn't prove that the dog caused the fight. The evidence according to Noel was that the defendant just happened upon the fight. There's no evidence of really how it got started. And number three, so same thing, this is a separate independent ground for reversing the case. The court says there's no evidence the dog alleged to belong to the defendant was a dangerous animal or one unfit to be kept. Let's move on to the court's fourth reason on page 510. The court has a, another independent reason to reverse the case, and it says the evidence is slight that the dog died in consequence of this fight. As an aside, this is a strange finding, but it, the court almost like didn't know how to bring it up, so it really kind of told you what it what you needed to know already, but then it's just kind of adding on more context of the questions in the case. Sometimes the questions are a little bit more interesting than the answers. Maybe the court doesn't have proof of this, but it at least has questions, and sometimes questions are not good. The evidence is slight that the dog died in consequence of this fight. I should infer from the evidence that he continued his annoying visitations until someone who did not own a white dog with black spots on his head made use of a shotgun or Sharp's rifle or some other substitute to abate the nuisance. But as this question is left in doubt by the evidence, the judgment of the justice is conclusive as to the cause of death. So the court is saying, okay, I know the standard of review requires me to not draw this conclusion, but there's at least a weird question. So the court even goes out out of its way to say, I'm not going to decide that, but I thought about it. However, in the same paragraph, the court is saying, overall, there's still not nearly enough proof. I can, however, see no just grounds for the judgment. It can only be supported upon the broad ground that when two dogs fight and one is killed, the owner can have satisfaction for his loss from the owner of the victorious dog, and I know of no such rule. So that line, I know of no such rule, goes back to the court's open where it talks about how am I to judge this there's really no evidence it looks like two dogs were fighting you didn't prove what you needed to 
And so we get to the court's conclusion. It says the judgment of the county court and of the justice reversed. Dog law. Dog law. Our final case of the day is Strong versus Georgia Railway and Electric Company, cited by the Supreme Court of Georgia. 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 On August 13th, 1903. The opinion for the court is by Chief Justice Simmons. And you see the court syllabus here. It is short and sweet. In fact, the majority opinion doesn't have much written explanation at all. As you see, it's about half page of notes. It says judgment affirmed by five justices and it says there are two main issues of law which control the decision first we have precedent on this issue jameson versus southwestern railroad which holds that suit cannot be maintained against a railway company for the negligent killing of a dog and two as the rule announced in the above stated case has stood as good law since december 1st 1885 and the General Assembly has passed no act changing the same, this court is of opinion that the rule should not be now changed by overruling that case. Judgment affirmed by five justices. And there's a little bit of a summary of the case. It says it was an action for damages, an action for the negligent killing of the plaintiff's dog by a car of the defendant. A general demur to the petition was sustained and the plaintiff accepted. What that means is the plaintiff filed a lawsuit and the defendant gave a general demur, which is basically a motion for dismiss. It's a not really used anymore. Now you would say the plaintiff moved to dismiss. And the motion to dismiss was granted but this is like one of the first things you can even do in court is to say please dismiss this the plaintiff appealed and this is that decision it was decided in a half a page and it was affirmed but now there's a long concurrence opinion the concurrence is not the controlling law for this case it's just having a longer discussion about an issue that was not necessary to decide the case but is more hey another case could come up that similar to this and I want to share my thoughts. And the reason why this is written, as you'll see, is there's an assumption in the precedent. This case is controlled by precedent. Five justices say that. But there's an assumption in the precedent that a dog is not property that you can file a lawsuit over. The question as to how far the dog shall be treated as property has been the subject of numerous decisions in the different courts of this country. The trend of modern decisions seems to be in favor of treating the dog as property to the same extent that other domestic animals are treated. Speaking alone for myself, I see no good reason why the dog should not have the same status before the law as the hog, the barnyard fowl, or any other domestic animal usually found about homes and farms. The court states, our attention has been called to an interesting opinion filed in the case, which bears evidence not only of the usual learning and research of that judge, but also of the fact that he is not unable to deal with the subject of the dog in a sentimental way. I take the liberty of attaching here two extracts from this opinion. The dog has figured very extensively in the past and present. In mythology, as Cerebus, he was entrusted with watching the gates of hell, and he seems to have performed his duties so well that there were but few escapes. In the history of the past, he has been used extensively for hunting purposes, as the guardian of purposes and property, and as a pet and companion. He is the much valued possession of hunters the world over, and in England especially is the pack of hounds highly prized. In literature, he has appeared more often than any other animal except perhaps the horse. The dog has even invaded the domain of art. All who have seen Sir Edwin Lanzier's great pictures will know how much human intelligence can be expressed in the face of a dog. His picture entitled Laying Down the Law will not be forgotten in considering the the dog as a litigant. Originally, all the animals which are now used by man were wild. One after another, they became domesticated and subject to his control, ownership, and use. 
as time progressed, they gradually lost their character of wildness, became more and more subject to mankind and more and more regarded as ordinary property. At this day, no one would contend that the horse was not the subject of absolute property because his ancestors were originally wild, and the same may be said of other animals now thoroughly recognized as domestic. Even in the days of Blackstone, while it was declared that the property of a dog was base property, it was nevertheless asserted that such property was sufficient to maintain a civil action for its loss. Since that day in the evolution of civilization, the dog has not been left behind. So the court is saying here that obviously the dogs are property, so we should recognize that. As already stated, a civil action could be brought for the loss of a dog. Generally, property which may be sold and possession delivered is a subject of levy. That's a form of lawsuit to recover property. And it cites some old precedent saying that that was an available action. The court notes in its decision one opinion by Chief Justice Appleton, who dissented and in his opinion stated of a dog, he is a domestic animal. From the time of the pyramids to the present day, from the frozen pole to the torrid zone, wherever man has been, there has been his dog. Cuvier has asserted that the dog was perhaps necessary for the establishment of civilized society, and that a little reflection will convince us that barbarous nations owe much of their civilization above the brute to the possession of the dog. He is the friend and companion of his master, accompanying him in his walks, his servant aiding him in his hunting, the playmate of his children, and inmate of his house, protecting it against all assailants. Now the court directly confronts the precedent that it has an issue with, which was cited in the court's summary decision. In the case of Jameson versus Southwestern Railroad, it was held that a dog was not such property that if it were killed by a railroad train, a presumption would arise against the company or that there could be a recovery for its mere negligent killing. It is true that in the course of the opinion in the Jameson case, the learned justice who delivered it made use of the following in language. Dogs are not property in such senses makes them assets belonging to the estate of a deceased person and are never inventoried and appraised however numerous or valuable nor are they the subject to levy and sale so far as we are informed. This was merely said arguendo and the concurrent opinion is undermining the precedent by quoting what seems like an important passage and saying this is just dicta, dicta, dicta. This is just dicta. It's saying, don't read too much into dicta of the precedent. No question of levy and sale was before the court. And while the justice was one distinguished for his learning, such a casual remark cannot be held to have been the deliberate decision of the court. And just to show you here, the concurrence did have one justice join it. It's by Justice P. Fish, I concur in the judgment and the rulings of the court for the reasons stated in the concurring opinion of Justice Cobb. Dogs should be recognized as property. Thank you for watching, my friends. Stay tuned to this channel. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, hit that bell, get notifications so you know you will not miss a minute of all the loving, dreaming, and smiling we got going on here at Peace in America. Be sure to tell me what you want to see on this channel in the comments. Share it with your friends. Tell your dogs. Tell your friends' dogs. We want everybody to come join the movement for peace in America. Let's go! Yeah! Like and subscribe, please. <laughs> Thank you.